I think that the great emancipator and the great politician are one and the same. They're the same person. And there's not one without the other. I don't think I have to tell you that this is a special episode of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics because we've got Sidney Blumenthal on the program today. That's right. Three quick thanks. I want to thank you, the listeners of the program. Your support over the years. I have people that have been listening to me for a decade. I have people that have been listening for a couple weeks. All of your support has helped make this moment happen. Think about this, if you can, the premium podcast from My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. You'll get bonus episodes. It can be as little as $2 a month. The link is at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. I'm on there right now talking about the Comey hearings, the Puerto Rican referendum and statehood in general, and the UK general election. What a surprising result. I also want to urge you, also, can you fill out our listener survey? It'll only take 30 seconds, and it will help us greatly. That's also at www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Very quick survey. This is a very important episode. Let this be the episode that you share with others. Let's spread the word about My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Help us get it out there. Thank you. Sidney Blumenthal is the author of Wrestling with His Angel, The Political Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 2. He's also the author of Self-Made Man, Volume 1 of that series. He is the former assistant and senior advisor to President Bill Clinton and senior advisor to Hillary Clinton. He has been a national staff reporter for The Washington Post and a writer and editor for The New Yorker. His books include the best-selling The Clinton Wars, The Rise of the Counter-Establishment, and The Permanent Campaign. And he joins me now on My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Sidney, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Your book, which is uh, Wrestling With His Angel, the volume two of a series that you've begun on the political life of Abraham Lincoln, I believe it's just a wealth of information about a period in history 1846 to 1856, Pope to Buchanan, for those who measure everything by presidents, uh, a period in history that Americans need to know more about, kind of Lincoln before the Lincoln that's well known. And in this volume, there are actually, even though it's a story about Lincoln, what I love about it is a number of non-Lincoln actors. And so if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about them. I start with the Whig Party. It's a name that some of my listeners might be more familiar with than than the average uh, American, but I often get the question, you know, what happened to the Whig Party that that led to its destruction as as a viable force in American politics? Yeah, well, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln was a Whig, and he spent most of his life as a stalwart Whig. That's the party of by and for Lincoln. Uh, He came to be a Republican only later. He Lincoln entered politics at the age of 23, and uh, he was the Whig floor leader of the Illinois uh, State Legislature at the age of 27. He was really a wunderkind uh, of politics, and uh, uh, he stayed a Whig longer than most people. He really clung to the Whig Party, uh, you know, even when it was disintegrating. The Whig Party um, was a national party. that arose partly in reaction to uh, Andrew Jackson and the uh, Democratic Party. It was an incoherent party. It had different parts based on different regions and different leaders. One part in New England was led by Daniel Webster. And one part in the middle of the country uh, was led by Henry Clay of Kentucky. And Clay really was the one who defined 
the essence of whatever Whigism was. It was for his American system of uh, building uh, infrastructure, of uh, canals and uh, roads, and a role for the federal government in that. He was for the Union. Uh, he said, I know no East, West, North, or South. He was known as the Great Compromiser. He was behind the uh, Missouri Compromise of 1820, 1821, which drew a line through the country north of which slavery was prohibited, except for the state of Missouri. And that that's a crucial incident and enables the Whig Party really to exist because it marginalizes slavery. The Whig Party can't really hold together unless slavery is pushed to the margins. Uh, it's the only way it can stay a national party with a northern and a southern wing. Would Lincoln consider Clay to be his model? Uh, early on, Lincoln con- called Clay his beau ideal of a statesman. Mm. But, uh, you know, Lincoln, the young practical politician, didn't support him for president. Uh, in um, 1840, he supported William Henry Harrison because he thought he would win, unlike Clay. Uh, Clay had spent a lot of time in politics and had a lot of baggage, as we say. And uh, Lincoln wanted to win. Uh, so uh, Lincoln did not support him in uh, 1848 either. He, uh, he supported Zachary Taylor. He was part of a group uh, in the Congress. This is Lincoln's one term in the Congress known as the Young Indians. They were a young a group of uh, very ambitious Whigs uh, who attacked um, the administration of James K. Polk, the Democrat, and worked very hard for the Whig candidate who turned out to be uh, the general in the Mexican War, Zachary Taylor. So he's a practical politician. I mean, you see that in his in his early life. It's I think we're getting better at it these days, but for so long, Lincoln was so mythologized that to even see him as a politician was something strange for some modern Americans. I mean, is that part of the, the the reason behind your series? Well, this is this is the I'm trying to present the real Lincoln mm-hmm. and uh I'm not trying to drag Lincoln off a pedestal. I think that the great emancipator and the great politician are one and the same. They're the same person. And there's not one without the other. It's not a question simply of evolution, uh, of Lincoln somehow having these uh, perpetual revelations and ascending to, you know, a higher state. He's a developing politician. He's always anti-slavery, but slavery is not the paramount issue until uh, uh, 1854 with the repeal of the Missouri Compromise. So for Lincoln... Uh, he's, you know, he deals with the circumstances that he has at hand and where he is in the stage in his career. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's a very much a political life, uh, that Lincoln has. Uh, and, um, that's how he got, you know, he was very political to the marrow of his bone. But as those who knew him well, one of them was John W. Bunn, who was a Springfield merchant who funded his campaigns. Uh, as said, um, he was uh, unique among politicians. He was a practical politician. And he was a man of principle. He said, little men tried to do what Lincoln did and make very poor work of it. So Lincoln was highly unusual when he, you know, when the circumstances arose and he rose to the occasion. And uh, you mentioned that he supported Zachary Taylor over Henry Clay in the 1848 nomination contest. Uh, you do write a bit in the book about the very brief presidency and surprising in some way presidency of Zachary Taylor in terms of uh, some of his opinions. Do you think political history would have been different if he did live? I mean, he only lit, lasted I, two years in his, in his presidency before the... Uh, eating the fruit and drinking the milk uh, in the hot sun. <laughs> yeah, then died of, uh, apparently of cholera, in a cholera epidemic that claimed a lot of lives, including Mary Todd's uh, father, John S. Todd, uh, in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. But um, Zachary Taylor is one of um, uh, the surprises of my research and of this book. Um, 
I, I really think, you know, revisionist historians take another look at Zachary Taylor. Uh, it was a brief presidency. He, you know, he died, uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, he, you know, he, the Whigs, um, were always in reaction to what, you know, to Andrew Jackson, who after all had been a great general. He had won the Battle of New Orleans in the War of 1812. He was a military hero. And uh, they were always looking for a military hero. So the first president they elected, William Henry Harrison, was, you know, Tippecanoe and Tyler II. He had won an Indian War, and so he was. they built him up as a military hero. He died a mu- about a month into his presidency. Um, so the next president who they elected was Zachary Taylor, who was a military hero. He had he'd been a genuine military hero in the in the um, in the Mexican War, but he was a Louisiana slaveholder. Um, he uh, no one knew what his political views were really. He had not been active in politics. Um, he didn't appear to be, you know, oh, uh, how to put it, overly literate, and and. Um, uh, people in politics did not know him well, except that they thought he could get elected. And this went along, when you ask about the Whig Party, with their idea of government. They, the Whig leaders were really congressional leaders. It was Clay and Webster. And they thought they would that the president would be a figurehead and they would run the show from the Congress. And they would staff the executive branch and they'd have these military figureheads. And Taylor got in, and he uh, believed he was he was the president. And then he surprised everybody by declaring that he was against the um, uh, all the territories that have been taken in the Mexican War becoming slave territories and then slave states. He was opposed to the extension of slavery, and the South revolted. The Southern wing of the Whig Party and its leaders revolted. Uh, uh, and there seemed as if there was going to be a civil war under Zachary Taylor. He said he would lead the army. He was a general. <laughs> he would lead the army, and he would crush them. He said. He said he would hang its leaders. Wow. Uh, he was a. He was a. Very, he was known as uh, you know rough and ready, and he was. He was ready to do it. And then the next thing you know, he's at this you know, a van at the Washington Monument in the hot Washington sun and comes back to the White House and eats uh, this uh, fruit and uh, drinks uh, water and milk and um, he's dead, just like that. And um, uh, I think it's entirely possible the Civil War, such as it was, could have been fought under Zachary Taylor. It would have ended very, very quickly in the South, crushed and all the territories in the West would have been free. I think that uh, makes a lot of sense. I mean, I don't think the South would have been ready, even the few railroads that they had at the time. I mean, of course, that could that kind of alt hiss could go on uh, forever, but it does it does seem interesting. And then the 1850 compromise that then Millard Fillmore puts through is often in textbooks, you know, saluted as a great bipartisan deal. It was Henry Clay's last deal. Your book shines a little bit more of a spotlight on it, perhaps a uh, night vision goggles on it, uh, that there might have been more deals in the back rooms and railroad bonds uh, dangled in front of people and, and proposals for new railroads to the South, and that it was really maybe some of the players like Jefferson Davis uh, working along with Stephen Douglas rather than just Henry Clay passing that great compromise. Yeah, uh, the Compromise of 1850 is um, highly mythologized into this um, iconic view of, especially of the Senate, as though it were a classical Roman ideal forum. And these great titans like, uh, you know, Clay and Webster and Calhoun, all playing their different roles, but you know, men of principles who deliver these deathless orations, and then the country is somehow saved because they believe in the union. This is um, this is not what happened. <laughs> Just not what happened, and not who these people are, and not how people responded to it. Um, 
Clay attempted to relive his past and uh, still wanted to be, they all wanted to be president. When you're dealing with Clay Webster and Calhoun, you're dealing with people of curdled ambition who had all wanted to be president and failed to be president. Well, uh, so much has changed in the Senate. Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, we're about to, I think, in the future, experience the Boston Marathon with the senators running for president. But Clay tried to patch together a grand compromise like he had in the Missouri Compromise, and um, it fell apart. It completely collapsed. Uh, he was um, enfeebled physically. He could barely climb the stairs of the uh, Capitol. And uh, this legislative genius, it just lost the touch. And um, it all shattered in his hands. And then Webster, who supported the compromise, uh, it, it, the compromise, as it was, was, a, was opposed by the anti-slavery Northerners who were opposed to leaving open the question of the extension of slavery to Western territories, which the compromise left open for a lot of the territories, and it included a federal Fugitive Slave Act for the South. Webster was in favor of it, and he was destroyed in his home state of Massachusetts. Um, he was excoriated. He was considered to, to be, you know, a fallen angel, a Lucifer itself. It's a big fall. Yeah, it was a very big fall, a moral fall for him. Uh, and, uh, and, and Calhoun was, uh, a dying man. He couldn't even speak. And he composed this speech that was really a, a malediction, a curse upon the whole country that he had, uh, Mason, the senator from Virginia, read for him in which he proclaimed, he was opposed to any compromise because he wanted the entire territories open to slavery and all of them turned into slave states. And uh, he said, you know, if you don't do this, you're going to get a civil war. Uh, you have Thomas Hart Benton, the senator from Missouri, basically calling him, you know, satanic. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's 1852. That's early on. That's 10 years before everything. Yeah. So, and the whole thing collapses. And who steps in but Stephen A. Douglas, who's, um, you know, in his, in his 30s and... Um, when Clay collapses, Douglas steps forward. He knows he knows how to pass this bill. He cuts it up into pieces, and uh, he attaches each each piece of legislation to a financial interest, like the Texas bond lobby <laughs> or the Illinois bond lobby. Illinois bonds have been bad since the Panic of 1837. Uh, Texas bonds depended upon Texas being fully admitted as a state. And so on. And he had a bigger agenda in the background, which was to build the Illinois Central Railroad from Chicago all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. He had uh, gone into uh, certain southern states, talked to the legislatures, and uh, uh, they were open to those uh, special interests. And Douglas himself had bought the lakeshore land in Chicago, which he then sold as the right of way. Uh, and tied into this was Wall Street, State Street in Boston. Enormous financial interests were uh, the lobbyists in Washington, the banks, uh, and that's why Douglas emerged as a national leader, and why the Compromise of 1850 passed, which was linked to the Illinois Central Railroad Act, the first great federally charted uh, railroad, and um, uh, a great spur to industrialization in the country, and Douglas then. Uh, presented himself as the embodiment, the spirit of the age, he said, the zeitgeist of manifest destiny, America going to the West. And underneath it was, in its own 19th century way, the art of the deal. And uh, it seems so uh, like events that do occur today. And the Compromise of 1850, I mean, I, I guess the main components being, you know, we're going to let California in as a free state that's water probably under the bridge anyway and and we're also going to pass the fugitive slave law and it sounds great in, in washington dc among a group of senators but people just hated it it seemed in the in the country and there was just active resistance to it well millard fillmore who's president now after zachary taylor he'd been the vice president and uh, he declared this the final settlement 
that slavery was off the table uh, with the, with the Compromise of 1850. It would have been removed as a divisive issue in the country. And um, uh, with the Democrats having, I mean, the only place where it was really uh, opposed on a, in a serious way was in Massachusetts uh, by anti-slavery people. Uh, and they were all caught up in uh, resistance to the Fugitive Slave Act. Uh, but for the rest of the country, they just went on, you know, and then there was a kind of resistance that developed. You know, Harry, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin as a protest against the Compromise of 1850. And there was, you know, I mean, the it's an, it's a strange country, you know, with cultural, um, you know, resonances. Herman Melville really wrote Moby Dick during the whole uh, proceedings involving the Compromise of 1850, and it was a dark prophecy. Pequod's the United States, and Ahab is John C. Calhoun. And the oh, whole is that country, right? Yeah, the country just goes down. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a great allegory, but... That's the period in which he, he was in, influenced in, in writing Moby Dick. So, uh, so we enter this period in which the Democrats are uh, uh, the dominant party. The Whigs have uh, have been have lost their cause. Um, Franklin Pierce is elected in the greatest landslide in American history to that point in 1852, and the Whigs are completely eclipsed. Slavery is off the table, and politics, according to Lincoln, sitting in his law office with his law partner, William Henry Herndon, is dead. And Lincoln is despairing and left to wandering from county courthouse to county courthouse as an obscure one-term, you know, former congressman. And um, then... Kansas, Nebraska happens during the Pierce administration, and everything seems to change. Well, we're back to our old friend Stephen A. Douglas, uh, Lincoln's perennial rival, the senator from uh, Illinois. He had wanted to be the president in 1852, but uh, he felt he hadn't gotten all the credit he deserves for for the Compromise of 1850 and the Illinois Central Railroad Act. Uh, and he had also run a miserable campaign in which he had insulted every major figure in the party uh, and uh, had alienated everybody. Um, and he was also a threat. He was young. He was dynamic. He understood the forces of modernization and industrialization. He had money behind him. He was uh, clever, and he was a demagogue. Uh, and he was unprincipled, so he was not bound by anything. He was a party of one. So they all feared him. So they cut him out in 1852, and they cut him out of the patronage. And Douglas wanted to be president. So how was he going to be president? He wanted to. He had built the Illinois Central Railroad. Now he wanted to build the trans a transcontinental railroad. That was his vision. He's Mister Manifest Destiny. He wants to build a railroad to the west. And he also wants to profit from it, among other things. It's, that's, you know, the least of his, you know, interests. Um, he buys land in Dubuque, Iowa for a central route. He buys land up in, you know, Wisconsin for a northern route. Um, but the, the railroad has to go through the western territories, which are part of them are Indian territories. They're not organized, and he's got to get it through the Congress to have them organized. He's the chairman of the Committee on Territories. But the Congress is run by these southern barons. The South runs the Congress. They have the power. They're the powerful senators. They all live in a boarding house called the F Street Mess in the shadow of the Capitol. He's got to cut a deal with them. One of them that you, you bring up, and I just find it interesting because for so many people, David Rice Atchison, all we ever hear about him in history is he was that guy who... Uh, could have been president, you know, very because of the the, the dates that uh, the uh, the president was sworn in. I think it might have been Zachary Taylor, uh, and uh, he was the Senate pro tem. So technically, he was president because the president wouldn't be sworn in on a Sunday. Uh, we never hear that name in anything else. But in your book, you you mention how he was a force. Later, we hear the Atchison Topeka and the Santa Fe Railroad from after the mm -hmm. war. That's that. That's him. 
<laughs> that song, the Atchison in Topeka and the Santa Fe, that's David Rice Atchison. But in this period, he's a senator from Missouri. He's the president pro tem of the Senate. He's very powerful. He's a, you know, he's a ranking member, obviously. Uh, uh, and he is, um, belongs to the F Street mess where all the most powerful Southern committee chairmen live together in a boarding house. And, uh, Atchison, uh, has a problem in Missouri. Uh, he, uh, Thomas Hart Benton, who is the most, has been the most powerful political force in Missouri and basically created the state and had served as a senator or a congressman for 30 years, was the floor leader in the Senate for Andrew Jackson, part of his kitchen cabinet, hates Atchison. There, there, it's a mortal combat between them, and Atchison has to preserve himself in Missouri. So he throws himself behind uh, repealing the Missouri Compromise and opening these territories, especially Kansas, Nebraska, which border on Missouri, uh, up to settlement, which he thinks will lead to the creation of slave states and be very popular and, ex- you know, reelect him, exalt him politically and, and tip the balance power in the country to the south. Um, so Atchison is a key player here and, um, he's more powerful even than Douglas and, you know, he, he really twists Douglas's arm. Douglas is in favor of opening this. And then there's another player, Jefferson Davis, later the president of the Confederacy. But he is the Secretary of War for Franklin Pierce. He's really, um, the Dick Cheney of the Pierce administration. <laughs> <laughs> he's the power behind the throne. It, it sounds that way reading your book. It, any credence to the fact that Pierce enters the White House with the, his son's death and his wife distraught about it? Did that lead to Pierce's kind of weakness and, and sort of Davis being, having such a strong role? Or if it, was it just Pierce's and Davis's personalities as they were? Well, Pierce was, um, somebody who, he's a handsome, you know, man from a prominent family in New Hampshire. His father had been governor and he had been guided his whole life politically, you know, by his family. They, you know, they made him senator, uh, and he marries this, you know, prominent, very wealthy woman from Massachusetts. Um, and she's also the daughter of the president of Bowdoin College in Maine. And, um, uh, her, her uncle's a big mill owner in Massachusetts. Um, but Pierce, um, is, doesn't know why he's really doing anything. Uh, and, uh, he's, uh, he's a weak figure and he also has a, a weakness, which is alcohol. And he's a drunk. Um, and his wife is constantly trying to protect him and get him off drink, um, makes him quit the Senate. Um, mm-hmm. But his, you know, his father's group up in uh, New Hampshire after his father's death basically runs him as a dark horse for president. He gets the nomination. When uh, she hears about it, she faints dead away. <laughs> and um, he becomes president. He's a he's a Mexican War hero, and um, he, uh, he he knows Jefferson Davis from the Mexican War as well, and from the Senate. Uh, he's close to Jefferson Davis of Mississippi of slaveholding fortune, another heir, by the way, of, of fortune, didn't make it himself. And, um, Davis, however, is not like Pierce. Davis is a, a, a person with a vision and, a, a very ambitious and, um, and, uh, very, pre- uh, very tough character. Uh, and uh, Davis is really the guiding hand behind the Pierce uh, administration. Uh, he really guides it. He wants a slave empire. He has a vision of imperialism, of including Cuba and the whole Caribbean into the United States and turning it into slave states. He wants a he wants a transcontinental railroad, but a southern route that can capture the West for slavery. He wants to tip the balance of power to the South and to the slave power. And he is a protege of John C. Calhoun. Uh, He's the living protege. You make it more visceral than I've seen in other sources about 
why the slave power, in quotes, you know, was so hated. You talk about Lincoln and his experiences with dealing with his father-in-law's estate and getting beaten by people more wealthy than him, and there's, there's, there's more references. We hear that so often, like when we're reading about history, that, you know, it was North versus South, but I think there was a real fear in the North that could be made more visceral about what that power really was, that it was perhaps an imperialist type of power and a power of the few, a few families. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, it wasn't like there were two separate, um, you know, countries and they were self-contained apart from each other, but somehow in, you know, bound under one constitution, a loose constitution. This was a, you know, a real country in in which people contended for political power and dominance. And the South had had it. And slavery had become the most powerful economic force in the country. And the reason was the slaves themselves were the greatest economic wealth after all the real estate in the United States. And everything was built on the slaves. Mortgages, derivatives were created off slaves. The financial centers, Wall Street, State Street, all that was built off of slavery. The London Exchange, the um, the Industrial Revolution, the mills of London, of New England, all that was integrated, dependent upon the cotton trade, dependent upon the money. It all rests on the slaves. And um, uh, as that power got greater and greater, there was a problem because the North kept growing as well. And the North was growing faster than the South, and the balance of power was tipping in the country in the South, which had always held control of the federal government from the top, was in danger of losing it. And they felt that if they ever lost it to uh, an anti-slavery president, that slavery itself would be in great danger. And all of their vast interests could be liquidated. And that's why they sought a slave empire. That's why they wanted to control the Western territories. And it takes on a social meaning. Lincoln goes to Kentucky. He's sent by his wife as soon as he leaves the Congress, 1849. Her father's died. Family fortunes contested. Uh, a cousin of his, her father had married a very wealthy man there. She had died. And that man held the Todd family fortune. And uh, he was the leader of the pro-slavery movement in Kentucky and was, had forced a state convention to rewrite the Constitution to open the slave trade, which meant a lot of money in Kentucky. Lincoln arrives just at that moment. He loses the case, loses the family fortune, and he sees firsthand how powerful this movement is. And he sees it pretty early on. Uh, remember, he's from Illinois, um, so he arrives in Kentucky, his native state, but a slave state. And he really sees the slave power close up, and he sees it socially. He sees what slavery is like. He sees not all he's he's seen slavery as before, but he sees it within a state. He sees, as he says, uh, ostentatious young men uh, with the most glittering form of property. And that's human property, following them, trudging behind them, slaves. He's, you know, disgusted, appalled, angered, uh, and he carries that anger with him for years uh, until he comes to this um, insight that the country cannot exist half slave and half free. And it has to be, as he says in the House Divided Speech of 1858, all one thing or all the other. And is Kansas, Nebraska, Douglas's invention, but at the behest and perhaps the bullying of Atchison and, and the support of Davis from inside the White House, is that the bill that really kind of wakes Lincoln and others to, to kind of become Republicans and, and to get back in politics, for him to get back in politics? Well, we talked about how the Whig Party existed only because slavery had been marginalized as an issue. And Douglas's ambition to become president, you know, led him to sponsor the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He needed this enormous act, and then he thought he could get the nomination. And he wanted to win Southern support 
Um, so he cut this deal with Atchison and with Jefferson Davis, who's there's literally a meeting in the White House with President Pierce and uh, Douglas and the members of the F Street Mess, the Southern Congressional Barons, Atchison, and they all make this deal in this one meeting for the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and it blows up politics. It opens the issue of the extension of slavery to the West. It repeals the Missouri Compromise. It obliterates the line across the uh, country that prohibits slavery to the North. And Lincoln, who had seen what had happened in Kentucky in 1849 when he lost the Todd family fortune and watched the slave power there, believes that the issue of the nationalization of slavery is paramount. And many people are now galvanized by this. Uh, so Lincoln now has his cause, and he emerges. He delivers a the longest speech he ever gave on October 4th, 1854, to denounce the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He goes through everything, the history of the Constitution, and in his view, why it was against slavery as opposed to being a pro-slavery document. He cites all sorts of precedents, and he makes every argument he can against it and against slavery and the extension of slavery. Um, and he creates essentially the basis of the politics that will carry him uh all the way through 1860 into the White House. And a reminder that I'm talking with Sidney Blumenthal, the author of Wrestling with His Angel, Volume 2 of The Political Life of Abraham Lincoln, and it covers the period of 1849 to 1856. And I, I, and, and that's why I think we've been talking about so many non-Lincoln players as well, because Lincoln at this point is is a little in the background. Sometimes I reading the book, I felt like he was kind of a Hitchcock uh, type character. Well, where us readers know something big is going to come from him, but he's kind of in the background. He makes speeches. He's sort of trailing Douglas. Douglas right now during the period of this book is not yet paying attention to him. Well, there's no Lincoln without Douglas, the little giant. You know, he's he's barely five feet tall. Lincoln's six four, but Lincoln calls him a colossus, and I walk under his legs because um, Douglas had risen so far in politics, and Lincoln is in the dust. He's you know wandering around on his horse, old Bob. You know, in Central Illinois. Was Lincoln a liberal? Well, Lincoln was. Um, Lincoln, you believed he was both a conservative and a liberal. He used both terms. Uh, mm -hmm. Freely, he and he used the word uh, democratic as a small d, and he also in this period claims the tradition of the Democratic Party for himself when he becomes a Republican. He claims the tradition of Jefferson, the tradition of democracy against the slave power. Uh, he's he, uh, and so um, he represents you know the liberal progressive forces. He makes the argument that. Um, um, he says slavery deprives, in his great speech of 1854, deprives our country of its just influence in the world. And he says we should be the liberal party leading the world. And he uses the word liberal. So that's, that's Lincoln's idea of what the country is. His idea of liberal is free labor, uh, not slave labor. And, uh, to defense of democracy. Uh, uh, there's a book that is the most important book for Lincoln in 1854. It's called Sociology for the South, The Failure of Free Society by George Fitzhugh, who's a Virginian, who argues in favor of slavery and against democracy and against the Declaration of Independence, particularly the idea of, uh, that all men are created equal. Lincoln took this book uh, 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 to argue against point by point. Um, Lincoln was, um, obviously, uh, he was anti-slavery. He was against the extension of slavery. But there was also an anti-immigrant movement that had risen uh, at that time called the Know-Nothings. And they formed a party called the American Party. Lincoln was vehemently opposed to them. Uh, and he did everything in his power to undermine them. Uh, uh, in, in order to create an anti-slavery coalition that he felt had to come into being uh, around this issue of the extension of slavery. And that 
is what led to the creation of the Republican Party, of which Lincoln became the leader and the founder in Illinois. How much of your political experience yourself either fed into the book or helped you to understand the political events of the 1850s and uh, conversely, how much of Lincoln has over time influenced you in your political life? Well, I grew up in Illinois, third generation Chicagoan. My family has been deeply involved in Illinois politics, and I think I understand Illinois. And Illinois, you know, continues to be that state. I um, have lived in Washington a long time. I worked at the Washington Post and the New Yorker and... Uh, the New, New Republic in the old days, and I covered White Houses and have a good sense of how things work in Washington. And then I um, served in the White House as um, an assistant senior advisor with President Clinton and uh, have a relationship with him, had one, and uh, with um, Hillary Clinton as well, and, uh, and many others. And I think I understand how... White Houses work or supposed to work. I mean, it's a different era, a different president, but it is the presidency and there are certain mechanisms and certain constitutional forms that are simply there. And I've seen it from the inside and I think I understand how American government and politics works and that has informed my writing. I don't think I could have done this uh, without um, that kind of experience. Uh, but I've learned also a lot from Lincoln and a lot of lessons from Lincoln. I would say there are two things. One is I learned how Lincoln did it and how he became a leader and emerged and, uh, and rose from virtual, I mean, from the very beginning, from dirt poverty, and uh, um, and then from complete obscurity uh, uh, to become, you know, the leader in the country's greatest crisis. Um, he did. He he was self-disciplined, self-educated, and um, uh, learned how to make an argument. He was a lawyer and a politician who paid close attention to logic and to the points that his opon opponents were making. And he wanted to refute them and to win and to persuade. At one point he says, public opinion is everything. He wants to persuade. And he wants his language to be plain and accessible to people. Um, so Lincoln thinks very hard all the time on about how to do that. And without that ability, he never would have emerged as a leader at all. And that all comes from within him. So that's, that's to me, the real essence of great deal of his leadership. Um, I mean, there are other aspects to it, including his keen understanding of human nature. His understanding of politics is not at all mechanical. We talk about him as practical or pragmatist, but it is completely permeated with human sympathy and understanding of people's motives, why they are acting this way. And that comes from his own background of seeing human tragedy as well as all sorts of people up close throughout his whole life and studying them. That's one part of it. There's another part, which is it's considered a presumption to write about Lincoln. After all, it's said, there's nothing new to say about Abraham Lincoln. It's all been said. <laughs> right. You hear that. <laughs> well, besides, besides the fact that I have discovered new things and that I have reinterpreted, I believe, uh, much of, of this uh, story, particularly putting Lincoln in the context of uh, the life and times, um, and, and that's how Lincoln saw it, and trying to see things as Lincoln saw it and reacted, and what he reacted to. I also believe that for us, as Americans of 
this generation and of every generation, we have our own experiences, our own political circumstances, our own problems, our own issues that inf- that influence us and um, force us to look at Lincoln and learn new lessons from him uh, and see things. And Lincoln said, we must think anew and act anew, and then we shall save our country. That was in his second annual message to the Congress of 1862. But that's a general rule, and it applies to us, too. And we get to see Lincoln anew, too, through our own lenses. And so every generation has something new to offer about Lincoln, and we have to discover Lincoln again. A lot of books about the Civil War as well, being a significant time period in history, and he was president. Uh, had it happened during Zachary Taylor's time, as you mentioned earlier, I'm sure there'd be a lot more Taylor books. Well, there would be more Taylor books. That that might have been a sh- uh, you know a, a brief episode, <laughs> a briefer episode right. <laughs> than the you know than the trauma of the Civil War, and you know um, there's nothing quite like the you know, human dimensions of Lincoln and his story. Do you think that, let's say, it wasn't a Lincoln that won that nomination, perhaps it was Seward or um, one of the uh, Bates or one of the other contenders, would you have uh, this kind of unique American political model to follow or someone that would have lessons for us at all? You know, or is it this person? Well, no one knows what would have happened, but, um, you know, just in terms of the events themselves, it was Lincoln who held fast and um, for Fort Sumter and uh, Seward who wanted to compromise. And yet Seward was, you know, lost the nomination because he was considered to be the radical and Lincoln the moderate. But... Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, Seward may have been the more accommodating in that situation, which may have been fatal to the country. Um, and later his advice is good about other things. But in that moment, you know, Lincoln finds people to offer different advice. Uh, often he doesn't find it. Um, and um, he's struggling with rapidly changing events during the war, of course. Well, we don't know what uh, would have happened, just as we don't know what would have happened at the end of the war had Lincoln lived. We do know he won the war, that he managed to hold the the politics and the, the country in the North together to be able to get to the point of issuing the Emancipation Proclamation and then to find the right generals in in Grant and so on, after an enormous difficulty with the military. I mean, we can go through the whole war. <laughs> and then to to um, to manage the passage of the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery. And while he didn't have a vision of the United States as we're living it today, you know, of a completely, you know, a racially, of a racially, he didn't have a racially integrated view. Very few people did. But he did have a view of the beginning of citizenship for the former slaves. In his last speech, that's what he talks about. And John Wilkes Booth happens to be in the audience on the White House grounds and says, uh, let's kill him. Yeah, definitely a moment there. There's nothing quite in American history like the, you know, the human not only sympathy but empathy of 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 Lincoln the uh, it, it, it he's he's not only the greatest political genius but but sort of the deepest figure and you never get to the bottom of it it's the most it remains the most unknown and uh, this is volume 2 how many uh, volumes are you planning or do you know at this point there are four there will be, going four to be, four. Volumes. Okay. There'll be four volumes, and uh, uh, I hope to um, publish them um, yearly. Uh, I'm not. I hope. I hope I can get this. I hope I can finish the war. 
We hope so, too. And uh, I've been joined here by Sidney Blumenthal, the author of Wrestling with His Angel, The Political Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 2. Uh, Sydney, if people want more information about you, we'll certainly post, we'll be posting a link to this book on the MyHistoryCanBeatUpYourPolitics.com site. But if people want more information about you anywhere else uh, that they should go? They can go to the Simon & Schuster Wrestling With His Angel website. Um, And I just urge them to read the books, and uh, that's where they can learn the most. We do appreciate you taking the time to... uh, appear on the uh, podcast, and um, thanks very much. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. I want to thank our guest, Sidney Blumenthal, for coming on the program. Remember, the website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com for the premium podcast, and please fill out that listener survey. Thanks very much.